The Barony of Loth, the necromancer faction of Songs of Conquest, and arguably the most popular one of the game. In this first of my faction guide videos, I want to help you out in discussing the many aspects of each of the factions within the game. We'll start out by going over a general faction overview, units, wielders, and then close the video out by talking about spells and skills, as well as building priority. One thing I do want to mention before going further into the video is that Songs of Conquest is really about how you want to play the game. Going for a taller, stronger army via research or a larger wider army via aggressive building progression each or i'm sorry even further the wielder you choose can be focused more on combat or spell casting whatever it is so while this guide is meant to give you a sense of better understanding of the barony of loth i truly encourage you to find a play style that really fits with what you look for in a game min maxing the game isn't going to net you that much more of a benefit compared to immersing yourself in a style that is all your own with that, you can navigate to each of the sections outlined above using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. And if you end up enjoying the video, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll be covering Songs of Conquest with tons of guides, streams, and other fun videos in the future. But let's get started here on our faction guide for the Barony of Loth. To start us off with a simple faction overview, I want to talk about the Barony of Loth, not from a lore perspective, because I do want to save some of those kernels of lore for your... Uh, kind of discovery. But the Barony of Loth itself is a very fun faction, and I think that it's a faction that a lot of people are really going to jump in with, because I think on a lot of us from a Heroes of Might and Magic perspective, and I'll use that comparison a lot throughout this video, because I think it's the easiest way to correlate or relate to some information, but I think uh, Necropolis was a very fun and very popular faction, right? Undead and vampires and what have you. And you get something similar to that in Barony of Loth. This is not a tried and true undead faction where every single person is dead. In, quite, it, in fact, it's not really like that at all. So with the faction overview here, there's one big thing I want to point out. And a lot of the faction itself will be pretty self-explanatory, but there's one thing that the game kind of has hidden for you. And if I go ahead and take a look right here, we have Risen. Once the oath is sworn, Aurelius servants will rise after death to serve. Now, what this means is anytime a human barony of loth unit dies they will come back as a risen now again to compare this to heroes of might and magic we've seen that anytime any unit on the battlefield dies if for against necropolis they can come back as a skeleton right and you can amplify that with some additional effects you kind of get that here with the risen and the risen are actually very good from a, a unit standpoint comparing them over here to the legionnaires they're they're quite great like legionnaires of course are these are upgraded really strong units with 27 melee offense and 30 melee defense and the risen have about half that but at the beginning of the game they're a really nice good unit to get a lot of um, utility out of the beginning hero or i'm sorry human units you'll be taking advantage of so if i look at this guy right here the bane which is again an upgraded unit and we're about to go into all these units in just a little bit but this is a human unit you can see it says status human right below essence that means that when he dies he will become one of these risen and these risen are really nice ways to just kind of bolster out your army and i think that that as a whole is is kind of crucial to understand with barony of loth is that you want to focus on just enough command to keep an extra risen slot and it's also why if you were to completely level up command you'd have nine slots of eight available units you can take advantage of the risen which have a cap of 100 so you can have a lot of these guys in your army and not really feel like you're going to completely burn Burn through them quickly but it's an important thing about barony of loth and the game does not tell you anything about it you have to discover it when you lose a battle and you're wondering why units are joining you or why you're getting risen it's from the humans of your army dying so i wanted to talk about that before we dive on in to the units here we have all of our units for the Barony of Loth, and for ease of talking about all this, I'm probably actually going to jump into the Codex, but I wanted to show them off all here in a nice progression, starting with the Rats and in ending with the Legion. Now, the units for Loth have a lot of really crazy abilities, and I think that it's really easy to overlook things, again, kind of looking through the things of the scope of Heroes of Might and Magic, where <clears throat> your earlier units tend to fall off in, in importance if they are not used 
in mass. In Songs of Conquest, that's not necessarily the case. Stuff like this Legionnaire becomes viable throughout the entirety of the game because they are such a strong character once fully upgraded. And that's another really cool thing about the unit selection here is that when you initially get them there they give you a nice little power spike but once you upgrade them it really allows you to kind of slot into their full use case across your army across the game across the campaign whatever it is so taking a look at these the first two units we'll look at are the rats and the oathbound now these are some pretty crucial units now the rat here is uh, going to give us some destruction essence and keep that in mind right every single unit generates essence which will then correspond to the spells that you're going to be using and we'll talk about spells in a later section here but it's just kind of worth noting that you'll majority of the time be building up lots of destruction essence because that almost everything builds destruction with order being pretty low on the tertiary list and then the secondary one being arcana so it will be in that order of destruction arcana order as far as essence creation goes now the rats here are your initial tier unit, and, and if these units, if I did say that there's one unit that kind of has that, that trope of being, okay, they're really well used in mass, it is the rats, as you would expect. They have a very low health pool, very low uh, offense and defense, but here's what happened is, when they take damage, they increase their damage and their troop movement by one because of that berserker attribute they have at the bottom. So they're actually quite nice because they also have a very nice initiative at 31, allowing you to have them move very quickly from the start with a four movement range you try to kind of spike them across the map and do some damage get it whatever in that you can because once they upgrade here they're going to do a little bit more damage have a little bit more staying power but they get venomous Ven venomous now venomous is interesting because when you look at this it just says well one damage that kind of sounds crappy well it scales off of the level of your wielder here's a quick example of that this wielder is level nine these banes have venomous so their damage is Five, there's nine this guy his level is level five these banes will do five damage with their venomous so if you're kind of confused and going like why is venomous even worthwhile well it scales off your level so the higher the level of your wielder the more damage that venomous is going to do and plague rats will be strong in the very earliest portions of the game but to be totally honest with you the way i i like and the way i play i actually sub them out for the oathbound and legionnaires because the the legionnaires are really good the oathbound are really strong in the very initial play because they're going to give you some nice uh melee offense defense and health uh units to just kind of tank that very early start but i would say as far as all the units go prioritizing upgrading the lead to a legionnaire is huge because your health pool goes up by seven your offense goes up by, i think it's four right here yeah uh know, from seven to 12 but your melee defense almost doubles from eight to 15 and your initiative is very slow but the thing is that these guys are veritable tanks ability defend you're going to use this and it's going to pretty much use all your action for that turn but it's going to increase your, your defense by 30 allowing you to take more melee damage and then they're shielded so they'll already have an innate 50 percent range resistance these guys are going to tank the majority of a barony of loth playthrough in a skirmish fight because they're going to just be able to absorb so much damage in fact you can see here my army i've got two pockets of them if i were to prioritize research it would be increasing the size of my legionnaires because i just like them so much they generate order they generate destruction for me so i'm getting a lot of spell use out of them and they're really just really tanky really really tanky now, one thing that Sons of Conquest has is a musician. Every single faction will have one, and the cultist here is your musician, your buffer for the Barony of Loth. You'll get access to them pretty quickly. But what I think could be a bit of a misconception, a misnomer, is that, oh, okay, if I'm using the musician, I want to keep him in the back line. That's not necessarily true. Look at this cultist. His damage, now look at this photograph. His damage is 2 to 4 with a melee offense of 9. Compare that to your Legionnaire, he does a, a higher top end damage, right? Two to three versus two to four. And his melee offense is nine versus the seven. So you're not getting all the defensive traits here because his defense is six versus the uh, the eight of the uh, Oathbound. Um, but you are getting a character that can do some good damage. So you don't sleep on the damage that these guys can do because their ability of Glory's Gone is going to add five melee offense and five ranged offense to friendly units which is a nice buff and i believe it lasts for two turns if i can remember off the top of my head so this is a great way to buff your units up 
let the enemy come closer. Next turn, you move closer and do damage. Because the cultist has the second highest initiative of the entire army. So to be going quickly in your... Uh, in, the grand in the grand scheme of your uh, of your units, and you can get them up close and personal and do some good damage. So using them in mass with a troop size of 20, you'll be able to get a, a lot of damage out of them. And then upgrading them to the Oath Singer when you have the uh, uh, resources is a good call. I don't prioritize this because the benefit here is you're getting all of the increased stat line that you would imagine, right? You know, you're pretty much doubling almost everything. Um, offense goes from 9 to 16, which isn't really quite doubling. Health, again, goes from 9 to 18, which is doubling. And then defense goes from 6 to 12, so again, doubling. <laughs> but you get five more defense added to your ability here. So rather than just adding offense, you now get five more defense. So it's a nice way to further buff up your army. But I think that focusing on that upgrade is not as crucial as the Legionnaire upgrade or the next unit we're going to talk about, the Toxologist. So the Toxologist is your first actual range unit in the Barony of Loth. Um, if you're playing, say, uh, Arleon, they get, a, they get two range units by this point across their rangers and their militia. So getting the Toxologist online quickly is a really nice way to get a lot of range damage because they have a good ranged offense at 11. They've got a good range at five and their deadly range is three. So keep in mind, remember anything in the deadly range is gonna take more damage than anything at max range. So just kind of keep that in mind here. Also, they have got Venomous, so they will be able to swing out and do additional damage based off of your level that's going to scale. I like getting the Toxologist online quickly because it does also offer me a way to double up on my destruction, or well, I guess triple up on my destruction, but also adds a little Arcana Essence in there as well, because the Bane is a really, really strong unit. You can use the ability to aim and gain 3 range and 3 damage, which is very nice as well, and you're getting an increase on your innate range and deadly range. I use the Bane and the Legionnaire almost exclusively. As you can see in this army up top, I have got 56 total Legionnaires and 21 total Bane because my Bane will create Risen if they do die in the next game for me. And I'm going to have so much tank ability with those Legionnaires. I think this is a really nice kind of early game mix for Loth. And it's easy to jump into because the, the cost for them is not as huge. It, it just really requires you to get to the second or third tier of your Town Hall, which again, we'll talk about that at a later point. Next up is the Scholar here. Now this is going to be your next ranged offender um, with a ranged offense of 16 and a damage of 4 to 7. So you can see that they will be doing more damage per shot than your Toxologist, but the cost here is that you have a lower troop size, their health is 26 and they're going to be a higher cost for you per, but they're going to be basically that next tier of ranged damage. And again, I don't find the Aurelian Scholar to be as high of a priority until I get to a point where I need that increased range damage because their upgraded version, the Necromancer, is pretty spiffy. It allows me to charge his essence. So every turn, every turn in combat, the essence that a thing says, says essences Arcana 2, Destruction 1, will be generated for you, uh, you the wielder, to use spells, right? Well, I can generate it again by using Ability Charge es Essence. Generate this unit's essence for the wielder so it's very very nice also helpless troops can't retaliate against the necromancer so this is a great way to get a lot of damage out both the uh, the the scholar and the necromancer damage from range without fearing the repercussions or damage in close combat and not fearing the repercussions which is quite spiffy here but again i i really feel like Focusing on the next two units over these guys is a bit nicer in the early to mid game. I like to kind of come back around for the Scholar once I really need that range punch, punching power. Because I think Barony of Loth has so many good melee units that the Bane really kind of fits that ranged niche for me enough that I can focus enough on melee. Which brings us into the Scavenge Bones. Now these guys are pretty interesting. They're, they have a very small troop size, right? They're only five max troop size at the, at the default uh, stance or, or non-research portion of the game. But they do a lot of damage, a lot of good offense and defense, and they move quite quickly. But their downside is their initiative is very low. Which, depending on how you play, can be an up and a downside. Maybe you want the enemy to all move, then you can make a move that's more informed. Or you want to blitz across the battlefield, it depends I guess on what you like. But they have persistent, meaning that they can retaliate infinitely. So when your unit gets attacked, 
in melee, they will more often than not retaliate, but they can only do it once per combat round. So if your unit gets attacked by three separate units, it will only retaliate to the first one. With the scavenged bones, that's not the case. It'll do it'll do it infinitely. And then progressing to the Blessed Bones, you're going to get a nice jump up in health, a nice jump up in offense and defense, and a, of course a scaling amount of damage. But what you also get is Oathbound Sacrifice. You sacrifice one unit and summon a temporary Oathbound with 15 units in front of you. So this is a really cool way to just kind of spiral out of control and sacrifice units and generate a ton of Oathbound. This is where you can use low impact units like again the rats and kind of get more out of them to fill up the board a little bit um again i i kind of like just the base scavenge bones to 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 start off and then i would scale into this again as your um resources see fit i i really like to focus more on these two things and those resources to get those upgraded and then focus more on the latter two units and get their upgrades before i come back for the blessed bones um, and it's mainly because I just think you get so much power out of this next unit with the Spectre. So the Spectre here does a lot of damage. It's It's got a, a low max troop size of 10, but it does a lot of damage, a lot of health, and it can move pretty fast. Five movement is really good, and its initiative is great. It's got 20 initiative. Compare this over here to the, to the Cultist. That's 25, so it's going to be moving very fast in the grand scheme of things as far as its, its turn order, but it's got this cool ability called Stealthy, ignores zone of control. What makes that so nice is you can move, do damage. The next turn, if someone goes to surround you, you can pull out of the zone of control. Remember, zone of control gives attacks of opportunity. If someone, if you go to move out of a zone of control, that red era aura around a enemy unit, they get a free swing on you. So you can move the specter out and displace and help him really get the full advantage of that five movement. Moving into the Seneschal, you get an even further increase to all this because he also increases his essences. He goes from just generating two arcana to generating order arcana and destruction, which is nice. His melee offense goes from, ooh, uh, there we go, from 21 to 33 and defense from 19 up to 30. So you can see that this guy scales really, really well and his ability strengthen is gonna allow him to buff your units within one hex. So you get a lot of utility out of the Seneschal in a way that I think is way more important than the Blessed Bones. And it just is such a it's such a heavy hitting fast unit that can get around the board quickly and not worry about getting really swamped up in a lot of zones of control. Now the last unit is a monster, quite literally and figuratively. It is the Legion. And this guy is going to be doing tons of damage. You can get access to him in the early mid game, or you can focus on research. It depends on you, how you want to play. And he has some interesting capabilities here. So looking at his stat line, 25 to 35 damage, 85 health, really just a tried and true tank with ma uh, melee offense of 44 and defense of 35. He kind of takes off where the Legionnaire starts to fall off, you know, when you get to that mid to late game. And if you don't have huge stacks of these, they, they becomes a little bit of an issue. Well, the Legion's going to really shore that up for you because he's intimidating. So it gives enemy units within one hex, minus 10 defense and initiative, which is huge. And then his sweeping attacks, attacking a sweeping arc, dealing damage to targets next to the initial one. So you can really use this guy as a bit of a wrecking ball. And then when you upgrade him, Look how this thing just explodes with abilities. So he retains intimidating and retains sweeping attacks, but now he's shielded. So 50% range resistance, which is going to be massive, right? People are going to be focusing this thing down and want to get it down ASAP. Also looking at its defense, it goes from 35 up to 44. Melee offense increases by 11. His health goes up to 125. His damage goes up 40 to 45. It is way better. And he also gets ability protect. Give friendly units within one hex plus 25 defense. So you can keep this with your back line if you so wish, and then just drop down, protect, and he helps everyone out. It's a really nice ability, and also his initiative jumps up significantly from 18 up to 23. So you now have that ability with the high legion to really keep a nice backline defender, a really strong person to hold the line for you. So just to kind of recap here, my big focuses are on the Legionnaire and the Bane in that kind of early mid game before scaling quickly into the Seneschal and then kind of rounding out with either the High Legion or the Blessed Bones if I wanted an additional melee combatant 
or jumping into a necromancer when I see fit. The cultist is something that while I do like the ability, um, and I like the ability of musicians, I personally haven't found how musicians fit into my play style just yet. I, I do like having them, but sometimes I misuse them. And that's just me being perfectly honest and candid with you about it. So if you can feel that the, the musician is something you want to put into your army early to get a lot more of early melee damage out and a lot of great utility then do that asap but i think this is also something that you could wait to make until after you get banes but before you get seneschals and specters to kind of give you a kind of nice later early game mid game uh, uh units to pop out and buff up your army next up let's talk about wielders and this is of course going to be a large portion of your game and something that a lot of us look at when we again comparing back to heroes of might and magic we determine which wielder we're going to play based off of or our hero we're going to play based off of how we want to make our armies or what we want to focus on in our gameplay style so we're going to bring up the codex and here's just three of them right you have coral lightbringer here you have got uh why whyish the uh, returned and then you get murkoth so just to kind of give you an idea of what they look like but jumping into the codex to look at all of the wielders here we'll start with all this and again they are going to have a certain focus they're going to have a certain skill that they're starting off with this one an example is combat training looking back over here this is going to increase the damage and increase retaliations of our units as we make them so definitely a focus more on melee and Aldous is a pretty cool one too because he starts with some toxologists, some cultists, and some rats. He's got 12 movement, 10 defense, and 5 offense. So definitely when you think of his combat stats, you're looking at a higher defense and offense. Something that Murkoth will have uh, in a different kind of swap around there. But you'll look at each one of these wielders and you'll realize that some are focused more on defense, right? And some are focused more on offense. Some are focused more on range. Some are focused more on uh, casting. And we're going to go through that right here. Also, he specializes in increase on order. So having those spells unlocked for you is also going to be pretty um, crucial to the, his play style. Ambertina, um, looking pretty sexual, has zero defense, but a much higher offense, as you can see, with a emphasis on destruction and also giving her destruction essence. Remember, that in, that's kind of that context clue that tells you this one is meant for casting in, in some way, shape, or form. This is going to give her plus two destruction every single turn um, and also she gets more and more as she goes through more and more of the uh, uh, skill tiers here but you get a oops you get a much higher offense on her remember offense is going to increase your melee and your ranged and defense is going to increase your melee defense um, but this gives you an idea of again how she's going to focus coral is going to be the one actually I actually really enjoy Coral because I think he's a nice, good, balanced one. Uh, he's got 10 offense, but 5 defense, so you get a little bit of both. And also on top of it, his skill of guard and range defense, a range resistance specialization, I personally really enjoy because until you get Legionnaires online, you'll find that ranged resistance is going to be your Achilles heel. So taking a look here at guard. This gives you some melee resistance, and you get the innate range resistance on this character. So you have a lot of ways to keep your units very tanky, and that's something I really like with Coral Lightbringer. I, again, I think he's probably my favorite, personally my favorite um, wielder, just because he brings so much defense to Loth that I that I struggle with until I get Legionnaires online, like I was just saying. Next we have Brother Hilar, who is a... Uh, a man of the rats, <laughs> as you can see, five offense, 10 defense here, kind of the swapping of Coral's stat line was starting primarily under, well, all only into rats, and one HP to rats and plague rats, making them a little bit more viable in that longer game. Also, his skill is cunning, which is pretty wild. So this gives melee offense, range defense, and defense as an ability. It's an ability that he can use. For the first three battle rounds, Cunning gives all your troops this. So you can see that this thing really scales up pretty crazy once you get to the tier three. For the first three battle rounds, Cunning gives all your troops 25 melee offense, range defense, and defense. Making it so that if you are using rats, they become a little bit scarier because now they have already innate hit point bonuses from Brother Hilar. He already has 10 defense to give advantage of, and he already starts off with one cunning to give advantage of to those rats. So you can bolster these guys pretty well and make them a pretty scary early game unit uh, for the Bearing of Law. 
Magnolia Silverlink is going to be giving us a lot more offense here with a focus on more onto economy with the skill taxes and plus one to troop movement, meaning things are going to be moving around that battlefield a lot quicker for you. Just to show off what taxes look like. There you go. So plus 100, 250, and 500 gold per turn. Just a way to kind of bolster your um, your overall income. So I would actually use Magnolia as a secondary, third, or tertiary wielder. You are limited in the amount of wielders you can use. You can see up here, wielders three of three. And if I really had an extra slot, this is someone I would put as a permanent defender of one of my settlements to get the passive bonus of the uh, taxes here. The check could then maybe send her out to some, um, send her out to some sources of power to buff up her levels and then get a couple more other economy uh, focused skills. But that's kind of how I would use Magnolia personally. Marjada here, Dr. Marjada, is going to be focused more on spell damage power. Now, again, she has Arcana, which is going to, you guessed it, increase your Arcana essence. Again, a character that is focused much more on the casting portion of the game. Five and five offense and defense, so not so much focused on the melee and range portion, but again, focused far more on actual spell damage power. And now we can talk about Murkoth. Um, another one of my more favorite characters here, probably because I like the way he looks, you know, this really super undead kind of knight looking character, a death knight type, type of uh, uh, stereotypical role, but he has 15 offense and zero defense. This guy is meant to just blitz things down with damage. And you get that from his specialization, which increases 20 melee offense to undead troops. So remember we talked about that Seneschal, that Spectre, right? That, those guys are going to be doing way more damage. Same thing with the Legion and the Bones. So you get a lot of bonuses to your top tier units with Murkoth, which I really, really, really like. Also, the skill he has, Melee, like we've already seen, is going to be increasing that melee offense as well as melee resistance in that tier 3. So I really, really like this. You stack that all together, you're going to be looking at a total of 40 melee offense for an undead troop. And I really just dig that so hard. Uh, in fact, it's like I said, he is one of my favorite characters. Um, he is all 100% into, into offense, whereas Roderick of Loth is the opposite of him. He goes 15 into defense, and his specialization is 20 defense to human troops. So this can give you a lot of more survivability on your cultists, on your banes, on your necromancers, and it doesn't really hit with the playstyle that I personally enjoy. He does have march, which helps out with his movement which is, it can be nice to move around, maybe have him scoop up things for uh, a main character or have him ferry characters until you get a, um, or ferry units until you get a rally point set up. Um, again, he just doesn't personally fit my play style because I really want to bolster my um, undead troops and make them a little bit stronger and better. But again, with that increase to human troop defense and an emphasis on human troops as far as that, that specialization goes, you could be seeing yourself with a lot more of the uh, Risen, which is cool. The last one here is Weish, or uh, Weish, Weish? I'm going to go with Weish. And this is, a fo a f a f uh, this is a focus with 10 offense, 5 defense, 1 into Arcana specialization, and then the skill order. So you're going to be getting more Arcana and Order Essence to be casting those spells. So again, just to really quickly recap, my two favorite ones are Coral for a nice all-around character and Murkoth for a lot more of heavy aggression and an emphasis on those undead troops. Go with whatever one fits your playstyle. If you want to go with more of a caster character, you've got those options. But I think if I were to choose out the gate for the first time of playing Barony of Loth, I would want to try and pick up Coral Lightbringer and focus on him because he just gives me a nice good kit to work with while I kind of adapt to the new playstyle of the Barony. Moving into a conversation now about spells and skills, the biggest thing you want to take a look at with your spells is this little tiny thing right there. It denotes the tier of the spell. And remember here with Barony of Loth, we're focusing on order, destruction, and then arcana. There's also these that will mix two respective essences together to make one spell, and we'll talk about those in just a second here. But looking at this, we can see this is a tier one psychic spear. Like I kind of loosely mentioned in the wielder section, that specialization or that skill, arcana, that skill, destruction, or order, increases the ability to cast higher tier skills. Looking at arcana, so this is unlocks arcana spells tier two, unlocks arcana spells tier three. So getting those 
skills is crucial because it allows you to get those better spells activated. And what I personally like to do here is just simply click this and it will automatically fill in the spells that you can use as you generate um, essence throughout your fights. I, I think it's personally a, a great way to just kind of navigate through the spells pretty easily without trying to memorize which ones are really, 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 really going to be the ones you jump on. But protection is a really good one to give you some additional defense. I also really like quicken to help you move across the battlefield and increase your pretty low initiative on the uh, Barony of Loth. Um, also, I really like stuff like this. Aggression is going to help with melee offense and ranged offense. It's going to help with those Banes doing more damage or those Legionnaires doing a lot more damage. Some things that I really like. Also, a nice direct damage spell in Psychic Spear. Um, this just does 10 damage out the gate, but you know I've got one ability on one of my guys that increases his spell power by 40%. So that goes up to 14. So it's a cool way to do some good damage. Also, I really like Repel here because it will shoot things backwards and gives you some room to kind of move around, which is really nice. Now, all the bottom tier stuff is always going to be great, right? Arcane Storm, deal 25 damage to any troop within the target hexagon or the surrounding hexagons up to a distance of two. Nice AoE blast. You get a nice thing here with uh, Fireball too. You're going to be doing 30 damage, but a, with, so a higher amount of damage but a lower AOE blast. And lastly, for order, you get Rally, which is gonna overall increase the defense, melee, and ranged offense of all of your units. So you basically get um, the same ability that your cultist would buff, but at a higher magnitude and as a spell. Now, for your combined spells, the ones that you'll be focusing the most here are Strength and Essence, which is gonna give a nice bonus to all the um, Respective essence generation destroy essence is going to reduce that essence generation for your enemy You also get justices kill one unit in target enemy troops. So this is very nice when you are fighting against a low Troop count unit. So hey, you know this guy can only have five units in that troop Well, I'm gonna burn one down with justice, which is only four order and four destruction I think it's a very very strong ability especially as you hit that later tier portion of the game Aegis here is going to target friendly troop, get 75% range resistance. Like I've said before, range resistance is really going to help you out in the earliest portions until you put shields on your legionnaires or help to kind of counter any range play on your range units with this ability. I really, really like this one. Also, Rupture deals 40 damage to enemy troop, just a nice big raw output of damage. Is very heavy in the essence cost, to be totally honest with you, but if you're leveling this up uh, in its tiers, it can be pretty, pretty uh, wet, wet and wild. And lastly, Rapid Fire, all friendly ranged troops get plus one attack. I've talked about how much I like Banes, and you can really get a lot of use out of this with Banes and Necromancers working in conjunction, because this is eight order and eight destruction. So it is a little bit pricey, but you're gonna get a lot of utility out of it. Let's jump now over to our skills. Now, skills are always gonna be based really pretty much on how you want to play the game, of course, and I've said that so many times, but some big standout ones for me are any of the respective ones that are going to go into your magic, right? So Arcana, Destruction, and Order. We've just talked about those quite a bit. Just want to at least reiterate them. But you have stuff like Learning for increased experience gain. That can be something that you really want to focus on if it's a late game wielder, whatever it is. And also, you have your unique skill, or I'm sorry, unique resource skills. Like Eye for Amber will give you an income of ancient amber or find the meteors will grant you celestial ore or was it silk weavers or something like that crafty spiders helps out with glimmer weave so if you find yourself in a situation and you're struggling to get that and you really need it to either upgrade a building or get access to the large or medium buildings this can be a way to get you some income online without having to jump into the marketplace but I do really enjoy guard as far as some melee resistance for my units. Um, I, I really just find it extremely useful. Um, and of course, you don't want to skimp on command. You, you need to really make sure that you are getting to the command rank you have in mind for a specific wielder. I mean, rank nine is obviously going to be a big focus of yours, but making sure that you jump on it is going to be really crucial. Don't let it fall behind, but don't focus on it solely. I don't think you should be blitzing this to rank nine as fast as possible. You should do it with the amount of units that you can create for your army. Stuff like combat training is gonna help out with that damage. Uh, but stuff like archery, unless you're really trying to focus on solely on Banes and uh, Necromancers and getting lots of those in your army, you can let this one fall to the wayside in my opinion because your top tier units, your top three units are all melee units. So just kind of be mindful of that. 
If you were, say, playing Arleon, where you get two range units at the beginning of the game, archery really shines, I think. So I, I just kind of wanted to point that out, that there are some skills that I think you should play, of course, however you want. But there are some, I still think that, hey, you know what, archery is just not going to shine for you as much as, say, uh, melee, which is going to help out all of your top tier units, stuff like that. Also, when it comes to powers, I really like Essence Shield, because until they've attacked once, Essence Shields gives your troops 50% ranged attack. I really, really like that because it allows my units that don't have shields to get up close and personal and not take as much range damage. Also, I really like Eager here, because this is the other, you, remember, you get two powers per wielder, and Eager here allows you the first battle round, all your troops gain two movement, but when you level it up again, they'll get two movement plus 30 initiative. So it allows your really scary units to get across the battlefield quickly, and they can do it at usually a pace that is faster than your enemy. So I just wanted to quickly go over some skills I think are real big standouts for your army. Like I was talking about too earlier about those uh, economy skills, stonemason, taxes, again, those the other were the, the unique ones like crafty spiders. Those would be economy-based skills. To go into a discussion now about buildings, one thing I really want to uh, focus on or at least talk about is that jumping into your initial building sites and making something like, let's see, is it the croft here? Yeah, the croft that gives you gold per round is not the play with Songs of Conquest. That it, we, we have that kind of jammed into our heads from Heroes of Might Magic where you always go with a gold generation building. That's not so much the case here. What you want to look at with, and, and this is true of any faction, but especially Loth, of course, look at your initial units. Okay, this is a Rat Warren. You need stone. The Crypt, it needs stone and ancient amber. So that's actually kind of hard to get in the initial portions of the game. So what I would advise for you to do is make a stone building in your very first building slot. This is going to get that stone online quickly so you can make any of your first two unit generation buildings. Those are going to be very, very crucial. So let's go ahead and make our, our stoneworks here. But this is something that I would tell you, focus on that building. You can say jump into rats if you've gone with a uh, wielder that does focus on it. But I would personally bank up and try and get the Ancient Amber around me, if there is any. I got one right here. Do I have any more around me? I don't know. I, I probably do somewhere out in my, in my uh, outside of the fog. But I would save that second build slot if I'm uh, building out for a crypt, just to get my Oathbound online as fast as possible. Now again, keep in mind with this, this is just a recommendation on how to approach every single tier of your building town hall, but that's how I would probably maximize that first start of the game. Jumping into tier two, the way I would approach this is again, the same way. Let's open up our medium build site and take a look at what we've got. Now I wanna make Toxologist, like I've said before, that's what I really focus on in the way I approach Loth, but look at the Aurelian Sanctum. It requires wood, just like the laboratory does. Mausoleum, also requires wood, also ancient amber. Trading post, it's just straight up money. So what I would do is make myself a laboratory because that's why I like to focus on my builds. And for the small build site, I would now make a, a timber mill. So I'd wait a turn because you have to let this one produce. Then I'd make a lumber mill over there. And for the other build site, I would either, again, if, if I wanted to go with rats, I'd make the rat warren at this time. I personally don't like to focus on them, but I would maybe do the croft if i so wish but probably focusing on the guard tower this is going to give me some garrisons and some additional cultists and toxologists per round which is quite nice and it eventually can be upgraded to be some uh, some nice advantageous things here now at this stage too though i would really focus on upgrading any kind of resource generation i've got so since i don't have any uh, lumber yet, I would again make that lumber mill here, but I want to get my stone works up. It's going to enable, enable me to get double the stone per turn, and that is going to be a nice boon. But that's how I approach tier two, again focusing on the laboratory, a lumber mill, and then either a guard tower, croft, or rat warren, depending upon how you like to play. Pref preference for me would be guard tower or croft if I really needed the money, but probably just be guard tower. Tier three is where things get spicy because now you have to choose. You have a large building slot, your first one, and here you can make your legion unit. This is the access to the top tier unit or your one of two research buildings. Personally, like I've said before many times, I go research. And if I have to choose, it'd be the library of Aurelia 
because this gives me economy, wielders, and the ability to increase the capacity of my living and undead units. The problem here is that it does cost Ancient Amber. And if we look at the other uh, medium build site, it will cost me a lot of Ancient Amber to make, say, the Mausoleum. So that's something to kind of consider. You're going to be dealing with Ancient Amber a lot here, right? Ancient Amber here for the Summoning Circle, Form of the Unseen, not so much. But the medium slot, you can jump into the Aurelian Sanctum to make up any of the cultists or Aurelian scholars, if you so wish, or jump into the Mausoleum to get access to those specters and the scavenged bones. So basically, one or the other is going to give you two units. And do keep in mind that if you do make the unit, or I'm sorry, the building, you have to buy this research so this is going to cost you an additional 3500 five glimmer weave and five in ancient amber to make the scavenge bones so don't think that if you make this building you can make those units you have to do that research same here with the sanctum you have to make enlist scholars before you can get the scholars so it does cost you additional um bits of money so my personal preference for this medium slot I actually like to go trading post because this enables me to get access to any kind of ancient amber I need to make the Aurelian Sancta, or yeah, the, 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 the mausoleum, the mausoleum, sorry, or the summoning circle, or even the library of Aurelia come the next tier when I get another large and medium slot. Or actually, is it the next tier when I get another medium and two small build sites? <laughs> so that's a personal preference for me because I like to get that ancient amber online you'll be able to find it across the map of course but maybe you didn't come across a mine to get it or you don't have a wielder that's generating it for you this trading post is just a great way to get that initial boost of amber and then you can swap the post for another medium building site once you get enough amber secured but one thing i do want to tell you before you progress up to tier four and maybe even before you get to tier three try to get this crypt upgraded as fast as possible. This is another example of if I had the Ancient Amber here, even one more and the two more wood next turn, I'd be able to upgrade this crypt. So that's the way I approach tier three. Let's move on to tier four. As a quick little detour before we get to tier four, I always like to also make sure I build my walls here in this stage too. Tier three is when you can do it. And by building walls, you kind of force a natural kind of uh, entry port for anyone. They can't just simply Ra uh, uh, rampage through all of your buildings and destroy them. So it's a nice little way to kind of create choke points where you can stop anyone. They have to go through you in order to get into your town. Upgrading to tier four, we get two more small build sites and one medium build site. So with this medium build site, you're probably again going to want to now jump into either the Aurelian Sanctum or the Mausoleum. This is where you're going to jump into those units. Um, Personally, again, I would probably focus on maybe the specters and the scavenged bones, or depending upon what my opponent is and how I'm dealing with stuff, I might need more range and go with the sanctum. Again, it comes down a lot to personal preference here. But these small build sites, you can focus on building another crypt to increase the amount of legionnaires you're getting per turn. Um, also, you can jump into more of your resource production. Guard tower is going to help out with your garrison size as well. I really like to go somewhere here with the croft to give me a little bit more gold. If I'm really hurting for research, I'll make stonework or timber mill. But at this point, you should be getting so much stone and timber mill from your natural resource generation or just from the amount of money that you're generating per turn that you can just buy it from the marketplace. So I would do um, a crypt again for the legionnaire production and then a croft or guard, an additional guard tower to add more defense or more um, uh, gold generation okay time for the fifth tier so let's go ahead and upgrade here and we'll be granted with another small build site and now our final large build site so this is when you can get access to either another one of the research buildings or go with your summoning circle if you so wish again kind of depends on how what route you've taken up to this point if I got to this location and I hadn't built another settlement because you can see here I've got some other settlements over here and over here. Then at that stage, I would probably make um, my summoning circle. But if I've gotten a large settlement already, I've probably gotten another large building slot and I've made the summoning circle there. So in which case I would make the opposite research building here. So again, just kind of go with that as, as you see fit with your playthrough. Small building site, would rather go guard tower, croft, um, any of these ones again. Oops, didn't mean to do that, but 
I don't know, either here nor there. Now, one thing I, I kind of want to step back on that I did do earlier, or did not do earlier, was I made a rat warren. Because I realized in my playthrough, I was struggling with having enough board control because of the uh, enemy I was dealing with. So I built the rat warren. So this is uh, just an example of you're not locked into making any of these buildings. You can just simply refund a lot of the uh, resources you've put into it and just make another building that maybe fits you better at the time that you're at. Like maybe if you've got someone coming down the pipe, you just want to jump into a guard tower ASAP. Or maybe you've got another little settlement over here. You've got a rally point. Well, now you've got a further settlement down here and that rally point's not as useful anymore. So you can refund that rally point and make another one here. So do be mindful of those things. And one other thing I wanted to talk about before we conclude our little building section is that anytime you have those buildings that say, hey, enlist the scholars or this one over here where you, I'm sorry, this one over here where you make use of the bones. That is great, you do get access to it, but do keep in mind that these are some of the few buildings that upgrading them requires a second building to be created. So the mausoleum in this case requires the stoneworks to be made here. Uh, oops, that's the wrong building. Uh, this one over here requires that a croft is built. So just be mindful of those things as you navigate around your building choices and ensure that you do have the required buildings to make the next one jumping up as you progress through your tiers. But hopefully now this gives you a better idea of how to expand out as the Barony of Loth and a general progression of building choices that really kind of suits you. Like I said before, kind of adapt things as you see things kind of unfolding on the map before you changing rally points building out new buildings that really kind of make a little bit more sense for your campaign or for your skirmish and at that it brings our video here to a close so hopefully you get a better idea of how to approach the barony of loth you know you now you know that you've got those three major essences that you'll be dealing with that'll be generated from your units how to really go about those units or those wielders to really capitalize on the gameplay you have in mind for this quote-unquote undead necropolis faction envisioned in songs of conquest there is a lot of things to be wary of right make sure you're taking advantage of any kind of range resistance you can get from items from skills from from specializations whatever it is to maximize your units effectiveness in the early portion of the game and then jump down the avenues for the later game units or later game researches that make the most sense for your type of play style so if you have any questions about the barony of loth or any questions about songs of conquest in general please by all means go ahead and let me know in the comment section below if there's other things you'd like to see in future faction guides also let that be known below so I can kind of cater this content as it kind of uh, fits the demand of people jumping into Songs of Conquest. But as always guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.